morning, everyone, and welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Um, the Lunch Bunch will meet at 11.30 this Tuesday, June 11th at Cabana on the River. In case of cold or rainy weather, we will meet at Price Hill Chili, which we all know that <laughs> Mr. Holt would prefer, on Glenway Avenue instead. If you plan to attend, please call Carol Thomas uh, by tomorrow. Thank you for your continuing generous support of For His Glory Food Pantry. For the month of June, we will be collecting bath soap, deodorant, and shampoo. Each year, St. John's Westminster Union Church assists our partner, Delshire Elementary School, with school supplies and other items needed. And you will find a list of needed items on the snack table back in the narthex and in the life. So please join me for the call to worship now. I give you thanks, O Holy One, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. Praise is the glory of the Lord our God. For the love of our heart, we regard the love of what the Almighty has received from our way. You will fulfill your purpose for me, your steadfast love. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, shall hearken and be pleased, Lord, Lord, who can I say? For there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be remembered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in your word I hope. My soul waits. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with God is great power to redeem. It is God who will redeem us from all our iniquities.
So this morning's lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, and it is said that Jesus was doing good things, like healing and feeding people, but there were some who distrusted him despite the good they saw him do. They thought his good words, good works, excuse me, might be done in the service of evil. So this is how he answered them. Then he went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Bezobol, I think is how you pronounce that. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. And he called to them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God and from our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ to us. I'm going to be mixing sermon and scripture reading today, so I haven't lost my place. Uh, we'll be talking about the lesson as I go along. Uh, it's, it's important when we're dealing with some of these Old Testament stories that we give a good bit of background. So I'll ask you to bear with me a little bit today because we're going to do a broad sweep about this story and, uh, and it will be kind of preliminary to several Sundays to come because throughout June and July will be talking about the kings of Israel in the United Monarchy of Israel. 
and what significance that has for other parts of the scriptures. And you need just a little bit of background for that. Last Sunday, your new pastor, Andrew Bird, read the story about a young man named Samuel who was called by God in a surprising way when he was sleeping in the house of God where he was being mentored by an old man, a priest named Eli. It is said that Samuel was a judge of Israel, in fact, the final one of Israel's great judges. The exploits of the ones who preceded him are written in the book of Judges, the seventh book of the Old Testament. But Samuel gets two books of his own. He was clearly different from the earlier judges, warriors who behaved often like superheroes. He was not known particularly for his historic deeds in battle, so much as he was known for his wisdom and faithfulness to God. During the period of his leadership, many reforms were instituted among the Hebrew tribes. But today, as we pick up the story again, Samuel has become old. And perhaps unsurprisingly to us who have experienced a kind of similar group of feelings in, our, in the politics of our own time, the virtues of an elder statesman who's getting a little bit tireder than he used to be were not, insufficient, were not sufficient to meet the demands and wants of an impatient people who wanted to be led by somebody powerful enough to take action and protect their interests and get things done without being bothered too much by those who disagreed with him. We read that Samuel hoped that his sons might be able to succeed him as popular leaders, but when he tried to place them in such positions, they failed him by looking out for their own interests, by taking bribes, and by perverting justice. If you think I'm bending this story a little bit to make it seem like a modern political tale, I'd understand if you felt that way, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying what's written. It's all in the Bible. So here's our lesson for today. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You're old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Thou then listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Well, you don't have, you, you have to feel some sadness for Samuel in this story at this point, don't you? From childhood, he's been a faithful servant of God, the last in a line of heroic heroes who had been keeping together the loose confederation of the tribes of Israel during the opening days of their life in the land that they had come to conquer as their own. The people told and retold the stories of those days the days of the old frontier, we could call them, when there were threats from enemies all around and from time to time such threats required the charismatic gifts 
of a heroic warrior called a judge to bring the tribes together to fight off a common enemy. Those were the cowboy days that would be remembered in colorful tales for many generations among God's people. But now that form of leadership was coming to an end. Something more civilized and settled was needed to create a more orderly, more firmly established, more cultivated, and ultimately more humane society. The stories told in the book of Judges are amusing enough, but they're also tales of violence and brutality. The final story in the book is a, a classic one from Judges, it's one that involves mass killing, rape, sex trafficking, and vengeance, not to mention the cutting up of a woman. And that's just among the tribes of Israel themselves, no telling what the other folks were doing at that time. So the final sentence of the book is intended to recognize that the time has come when a change is needed, but it's odd it also seems to have a wistful quality about it. This is the final sentence in that book about the exploits of the judges. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Well, you know what happens when people don't do that, don't you? Under the judgeship of Samuel, the lawlessness of the age of judges began to be reformed. <clears throat> the last of Israel's enemies had been driven back, but not defeated. And the nation was brought together as a whole people with a sense of some, of the, co uh, some sense of the common good. Samuel had reason to feel proud of all that he had accomplished but maybe he had served just a few too many years to have another term in office. And maybe the people didn't have the same faith in God's slow providence that they had had when he began. So the elders gathered together at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old and your sons are unworthy to succeed you. We need a king who will take control of things and give us power over the others, a king like the other nations have, so that we can be the first among the nations with the mighty power of our king. So the people decided to trade away the leadership of Samuel who had guided them in accordance with their common values and traditions, and seek instead for the reign of a king who would rule over them with absolute power and impose his own values upon them, like the other nations' kings did. And Samuel was deeply disappointed. So Samuel turned to God and asked God what to do. And God comforted Samuel and healed his wounded feelings. They have not rejected you, God said. They have rejected me. It isn't because they've turned away from your wise teachings and ideals. In fact, they want to continue to seek your counsel. They want you to appoint the next king. But they still remember the great judges of old. Like Deborah, the warrior woman who rode with her troops into battle and Gideon, who sent the weakest of his soldiers home so that he could win the battle with only the strongest and best. And they remember Samson, blinded and chained when he demolished the temple of Baal after being deceived by the wily Delilah. 
by leaning against its mighty pillars and knocking the whole thing down. Those are their favorite stories, and that's how they think a leader ought to behave. And Samuel, that's just not who you are. And you're old besides. So now, it's hard for them to trust your counsel because they're afraid. It's hard for them to trust the faithfulness of God whose mercy is to those who live by faithfulness to him. So now, you have to listen to them and accept what they demand because they will have what they will have. But before you do that, there is still one thing that you can do. You still have one prophetic task of great importance. In the name of God, you have to warn them what will happen if they follow the ways of other nations and do not trust the mercies of our God. So here, from the last part of our scripture lesson, is how Samuel warned the people. Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people, it says, who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your sons and daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Oh my, what a warning that Samuel gave to the people of that time. Tone of his description of their destiny as people who have sought out worldly power. You shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of the king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's what Samuel said to them about 3,000 years ago. And it was a warning they chose not to heed, of course. On that day, the kingdom of Israel was born. It was led in succession by three highly gifted, powerful, and unfortunately deeply flawed men. King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. Three kings whose legacy was to build a powerful nation, but one that lived only briefly before it was divided and swallowed up by the empires of the ancient Mediterranean world. And what about the people? What became of them after that happened? Well, this is my favorite part of the story because the kingdom declined and was lost. But the people 
lived on without it. The centuries have not always been kind to the Jewish people who trace their heritage back to those ancient people. And their suffering has been great. But in a world where rulers rise and fall and nations come and go, and even the powerful empires have seen their day and gone, this people, without king or kingdom, has lived among the nations as a people of distinctive gifts who possess a deep awareness of who they are and the traditions and truths they have to share. And they have blessed us all. Without a king and out without much worldly power either, they have gone on living and building upon the ancient teachings and they have come to know the fragility of power and the ages long stability that comes only from knowing themselves as a people of shared values, faithfully living their tradition day by day. Ultimately, this story from the book of Samuel is a story about worldly power, its tempting enticements and its limits and ultimately its failure. The illusions it casts, the humiliating defeat it finally brings to those who fall under the spell of its fading majesty. Because a leadership that casts itself as power over others stirs its own seeds of discontent. And the one thing all worldly powers have in common is that they only last until they've bred a greater power to unseat them. What lasts in the broad course of human affairs is not the power we attain or attach ourselves to, but the progress we make to connect with one another in a spirit of empathy, a spiritual effort that we make to look deeply enough into one another's needs and motivations that we begin to see what we have in common and learn how to live with one another so that we're drawn toward one another instead of off into our separate tribes and become able to look beyond our individual ethnic and nationalistic ambitions that pit us against the interests of others. In all the great religious traditions, the anticipation that we will someday come to that day of global empathy when all our interests are blended into one is the very same thing as the anticipation that we humans will someday discover who God really is, who makes us one. That's why the love of God and the love of neighbor are held together is the central teaching of Jesus. Well, you've noticed, no doubt, that this story from the book of Samuel has been from the beginning a political one. And if this were a political speech, it would be time for me to tell you how to vote in this volatile political year, wouldn't it? But this isn't a political speech. It's a sermon. So my job is not unlike what Samuel's was. Just to remind you of the warning that there are divine consequences for the decisions we make, political and otherwise. And that there are principles we hold as followers of Jesus that should make a difference in what we decide if we want our decisions to last in the world. We could talk a long time about those principles that should govern our behavior as Christian voters and decision makers. 
things like welcoming all people, sharing our personal resources with everybody, seeking justice while condemning violence, welcoming the stranger, you know, all of those things that Jesus talked about. But before we even think about any of that, we might first want to think about what we can do to free ourselves from the things that tempt all of us not to follow our best intentions. Just like those people back in Samuel's day were tempted not to follow their best intentions. Those last words from the book of Judges have a haunting resonance for us, for us as well. I'll repeat them one more time. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. More than even the people of that ancient time, we're living in a time of rapid change. Change worries us. And rapid change has the power to throw us into panic. We've barely become used to the digital world, and already the world of artificial intelligence has sprung upon us. And the complexity of these changes have given rise to fears about loss of privacy and social control by incomprehensible forces. Manipulated images and social media bring disinformation into our homes. There is a new racial and religious diversity in our cities, and the aging white population in rural and small town areas has become more isolated and suspicious of outsiders and scientists and those they call elites, elites because they're scared. And into this heady mix have come the social media influencers, the conspiracy theorists, the talking heads of opinion-based news, and the know-nothing populist politicians who seem to be growing up everywhere. Metaphorically speaking, it's as though I can hear people shouting, I can't handle any more of this, just give me a king. Just tell me who to vote for so I don't have to be responsible and decide. When motions are high and people are deluged with disinformation, they tend to vote for personalities or labels and their expectations around issues of morality and ethics can be eroded as they come to believe that's just how it is in the world today, that morality just doesn't fit in the political world we live in. Well, I have good news for you today. And it's news about us. It will probably come as no surprise to you to hear that the mainline church is no longer in power. The Methodists, the Presbyterians, the UCC, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians were all out of power. You can't blame us anymore at this moment. Used to be, if you wanted to be elected to anything in America, you had to belong to one of those denominations. But that day is gone. Relax and rejoice. A few days ago, I read an article that said the evangelical churches in Cincinnati now outnumber the mainline churches and the Roman Catholics combined. But a few days later, I read an article that said the evangelicals are in decline because of their support for right-wing politics. Maybe we should send them a letter of sympathy, you think? So they know what's coming for them. We're not even in the competition anymore.
So what's the good news about that? Well, I'll tell you. Power is the most burdensome thing on earth. It always has to be maintained, and it's always endangered, and it leads its bearer into compromises that they would never think of doing as private individuals. That's why Jesus never accepted power. That's why the early church, while it was powerless, converted souls and grew. When you're not concerned with power, you can tell the truth. And you have a much better chance of getting to the truth because you're not having to deal with your own stake and the answers that tend to bias the way we look at things. When you're powerless, you can even speak the truth to power. And when you vote, you can choose your candidates on the basis of the teachings of your faith. I honestly believe that the church may have gone into decline in America at a time when God was not satisfied with it anymore anyway. It had confused its mission with numerical success and social dominance trying to control others with its opinions. And God didn't want that to happen, or at least I don't think God did. And I believe that we could be at a new time of birth for a church that knows better who it is and what it's about and can provide much better guidance through the complexities of our age than it was able to do before. So when we go to the polls this fall or make our decisions about what we owe to one another in our human fellowship, I pray that we will find the courage to place the compassionate teachings of our faith ahead of the anxious idols that afflict the world of power. And that makes me deeply hopeful for the future of people of faith, now freed to be who we always knew Jesus wanted us to be. Amen. Will you join me in the affirmation of faith taken from the first epistle of St. John? Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us.
Will you pray with me? Gracious presence, holy love, we thank you for this fellowship of grace where all of us who are gathered know our full acceptance here. We thank you for those who have come today to share in our worship together. And we thank you for all who are present through the recordings that go each week into many homes. We confess in this hour that we have needed this Sabbath time to come away from the rush and troubles of our daily lives and the worries of our world, and to sense your presence as we open our hearts to you. We recognize that we have often been too concerned with our own fears and wants to be as aware as we ought to be of the needs of those around us and the needs of those far away who wait for us to respond with whatever gifts we have to offer for the healing of the world. For any who are in pain or need within our fellowship, we lift up prayers for healing and we ask to be sent wherever we may share the message of Jesus' love. We pray for all who live in adverse circumstances, for all who are in bondage throughout the world, for immigrants, for those seeking freedom, and for all who live in fear. We pray for the victims of war in Sudan, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Gaza, and in Israel and for many still suffering in areas where communities have been torn by violent conflict that still smolders. We pray for the aid workers. We pray for the negotiators. We pray for the governmental leaders and all who seek peace with justice so that the conflicts may end. May we also find ways that we can support the efforts for peace in our own communities and in the world, and efforts we can pursue to help those afflicted with suffering, hunger, homelessness, and grief in those troubled areas of the world. In a few weeks, God, we will be welcoming our new pastor, Andrew. We pray for him in these days of transition as he makes his plans for a move to Cincinnati. And through these next few weeks, we pray that we may also prepare our hearts to accept the gifts he brings, to welcome his expression of your word, and to support the works of ministry he will encourage us to join him in accomplishing. And now we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us receive our morning offering. pray. Holy God, may the gifts we share make possible among us all the ministries you have called us to accomplish in your name. Amen.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.